Now you're live. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you join our podcast. Again, I'm honored to have our esteemed guest, Randy Cohen, who teaches at Harvard Business School and teaches actually the number one class that I had when I went to the school many years ago. Um, he's the successor and professor to the person I took class from. So I'm dating myself to let you know that. But extremely gifted, extremely insightful. And he'll be sharing with us his thoughts and comments on the U.S. banking system with an eye on what the Fed did to rescue Silicon Valley Bank, essentially guaranteeing depositors and what that will mean over the medium-term horizon because it's a pretty bold move they made and not all the dust has settled and all the implications have been well thought out. Uh, so we'll discuss that for about a third of the podcast. The other two-thirds is something that's been in the news and will continue to be in the news, and that's ChatGBT and AI and its disruption to almost anything you can imagine. So we couldn't ignore it. We have to talk about it. And we'll talk about the opportunity, the risks, what it means to the markets, the economy, labor. We can go on and on, but this is really a major breakthrough in terms of technology and its implications on the economy and even life. So this is going to be a fun one. So strap yourself in because we're going to get started in about five seconds. Jerry, please go to the next slide. So you can't have a presentation without a disclaimer. So this is our standard disclaimer. But just to be clear, this is intended for education. It's not intended to be financial advice. If you are getting what you perceive in financial advice, talk to your financial advisor. That's their job and not ours. But again, this is purely an education session and really we have a amazing gifted speaker to share his thoughts and comments. So next slide, please. So you have our headshots. You have a little bit about our backgrounds. I'll let Randy again describe who he is, what he does and why he's here today. Just a brief, discussion on me. I'm a co-founder of Bridgepoint Capital. Prior to this, I was a partner at L. Catterton, which is a PE firm that does consumer growth investing. Before that, I was with McKinsey & Company, the global consulting firm. I oversaw their global private wealth practice inside of their investment office. And just so you know, McKinsey Capital, very, very similar to Bain Capital, although Bain Capital spun out of the consulting firm, McKinsey Capital never spun out. It's still inside of McKinsey, and it's very stealth, but very effective, very successful. So I was fortunate enough to head up their private wealth practice. In a former stint, I was with Morgan Stanley. And as I mentioned at the start of the podcast, I'm a graduate of the Harvard Business School. So that's a brief outline of myself. And Randy, would you be kind enough to share with the group a little about yourself. Uh, sure. So I've been a professor at uh, for the last 25 years at Harvard Business School, except for a few years downriver at MIT Sloan, which was also a wonderful experience. Um, uh, I teach uh, investments. I have a, we have an online course on alternative investments that's very popular, and that uh, if you want to learn about alternative investments, is a great way. Uh, to get a primer on that in a relatively short period of time. Um, I teach an entrepreneurship course, Field X. The spring version is Field Y. April 18th is going to be our pitch day. We're going to have uh, 50 teams of students giving amazing pitches, and you're all welcome to join either in person on the Harvard Business School campus, free parking, or by Zoom. Um, and if you are interested, please send an email to my assistant, Lauren, at uh, her, her email address is fieldx at hbs.edu. That is F, like Frank, I-E-L-D-X, letter X, at hbs.edu, and if you say, hey, you know, Randy suggested I might enjoy attending pitch day, you know, can you get me the information? Uh, she'll share that with you. It's gonna be uh, 3.30 uh, on April 18th, uh, that's a Tuesday afternoon. Um, and so, um, you know, in addition to uh, teaching, I do uh, research uh, mostly on uh, how to find great investment managers uh, and great investment opportunities, and that's also kind of what I do for fun. So 
if you come across great investment opportunities, uh, reach out to me, uh, Randy at hbs.edu. Uh, I love to hear about great investment opportunities. And if you're interested in hearing about great investment opportunities, I love to just like be in the thick of what those opportunities are. Um, and so I work with lots of the smartest people, including of course, Mark and, and everybody at Bridgepoint, amazing group, um, but, but, and, and also some, some other uh, terrific groups. I co-founded a group called PEO Partners that does liquid private equity. And I work with a, another group that, that uh, gives great advice to you. So, so anyway, love to talk to anybody who's interested in investing. All right. Thank you, Randy. That was beautiful. Um, now we're going to dive into, I'll say, the first topic, which again is the banking, I, I have to say crisis. I mean, yeah, we, I'm hearing the phrase baby, baby banking crisis is the phrase I'm hearing around these days. Okay, <laughs> that, that's beautiful. I'll, 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 I'll steal your phrase. But just to remind everybody, there was a run on the bank of Silicon Valley Bank. Why was there a run? Essentially, I'll call it a duration mismatch. They locked into long-term treasuries at the worst possible time and then caused essentially accounting losses that I don't want to get into too many details about how <laughs> banks do accounting, but they have two categories, those that they mark the market and hit their p &L, and those that are described as health and maturity, which don't have to hit their p &L. But net net, they suffered major losses and the health and maturities. They had to do a fundraise that caused people to take closer attention to what they were doing. And that caused the panic and a run on the bank. And so many things about that story. But ultimately, the Fed came in and rescued it and guaranteed all depositors. So everybody's made whole. The, I'll just say, the implications of what could have happened if it failed were not felt because the Fed bailed it out. But that guaranteeing of deposits causes all kinds of implications. And that's really what I'd love Randy to give us his thoughts and comments on what, what the hell all this means. Great. Um, so let's, let's, I think there's been a lot of confusing reporting on this story. And uh, so I'll try to be less confusing. I can't promise I'll succeed, but at the minimum, I think I'll be confusing in a different way. And that's worth something, right? Because at least then you're kind of um, seeing things from a different perspective and maybe mushing together all those perspectives, we can make sense of it. Um, let's broadly say that there are two ways a bank could run into big trouble. And that is, and we'll probably all remember this from 2008, 2009, a liquidity problem or a solvency problem, right? And so a solvency problem means the money you owe out to your investors is greater than the value of all the assets you hold, okay? So that is a devastatingly huge problem for a bank, okay? Um, a liquidity problem means maybe the stuff you own is worth more than what you owe. You, in theory, are fine. But if everybody you owe money to, i.e. primarily your depositors, wants their money back right away, um, and you can't get to their money right away, then you can fail to be able to repay deposits, and then that is a bank crisis too. Now, this second case was best illustrated, of course, in the classic uh, movie, It's a Wonderful Life, um, in which uh, Jimmy Stewart explains to the people who've come to the bank asking for their deposits back, um, he says, you know, your money's not here. I'm not going to do my Jimmy Stewart impression for it. All right, I can't help it. Your money's not here. <laughs> it's in Bill's house, in Fred's <laughs> house, right? Um, so the point is what he's saying is, look, he didn't take those deposits and put them in a safe Right? Of course, a little bit's in a safe because on any given day, people might want their deposits back. But most of the money that a bank takes in goes out in mortgages and in loans. Okay, I mean, a mortgage obviously is a kind of loan, but mortgages, business loans, personal loans, and purchase of bonds, for example, treasury bonds, which are loans to the government. Okay, so that's where the money went. So now, if everybody wants their money back in a matter of a couple of days, if your money's in treasury bonds, that's fine. There's a very liquid market for those, sell them give people their money back, right? But if the money's in mortgages and business loans, then even if the value of those is far in excess of the deposits, you still have a bank crisis, right? Now, maybe that can be managed by closing the bank temporarily, giving them time to sell out of those positions, and then paying people off. Um, but of course, anytime people you know, are not getting their deposits, they're terrified that if they're last in line, they'll get nothing, right? So the, the thing to recognize here is even a small insolvency is potentially it eliminates the bank, right? Because if you owe out 100 billion of deposits and you have 98 billion of assets, 
right, then everybody knows the last 2% of people are going to get zero. They're not going to give everybody 98 cents on the dollar voluntarily. They're going to give everybody 100 cents on the dollar. You come in, you have 5,000 in the bank, they're going to give you 5,000. But if they pay everybody what they're owed, then the last people in line will get nothing. And so then everybody's desperate not to be last in line. And so everybody lines up. Now by a, um, you know, I don't know if irony is the right word, let's call it an ironic coincidence. Uh, my old professor, Doug Diamond, and his colleague, Philip Dibby, just won the Nobel Prize the last year for developing the theory of this problem and sort of, you know, isolating the kinds of solutions that are, that are needed, which is to say the government actually kind of needs to step in and say either everyone's going to get 100 cents on the dollar, so don't worry, or everyone's going to get 98 cents on the dollar, so that's a shame that you're going to lose 2%, but you don't have to rush, okay? And, but, but what's so powerful is if people have their deposits insured, if they know they're going to be paid, then they don't run to the bank to take all their money out, and then the government doesn't have to pay anybody anything, right? So it's one of these things where it's like a, the reverse of a self-fulfilling prophecy. In other words, by knowing that you're okay, then the government, it doesn't actually cost the government any money. And there have probably been thousands of bank runs that would have happened if there weren't for government insurance through the FDIC, but that didn't happen. Okay, so that's big picture. Now, what happened, what happened um, generally in the banking system? Before there were any problems at SVB, a big thing happened in the banks, and this I think has been a really underreported story. For six months now, what's been going on is that the banks have been, in a perfectly legal and legitimate way, scamming the heck out of their customers. And what I mean by scamming is this. The interest rate went up from zero to, you know, four, almost 5%, right? That is to say broad short-term interest rates. And what did the banks do? Well, they did kind of nothing, right? I mean, I can tell you that I bank with First Republic, which is one of the banks that's in trouble. And my bank account, First Republic, paid like 0.1% a year. And last time I looked a few weeks ago, I paid 0.8% a year. In other words, the interest rate went up by four, over 4%, 4 and they raised the interest rate by less than one. And they were making a killing on me because they're taking my deposits, paying me less than a percent, and then they're lending out the money at these much higher rates. So it was wonderful for them. But what happened is after a few months of knowing that I was getting underpaid, you know, I got myself together and said, you know what, I'm moving the money into a money market fund that's going to pay me over 4%. And I want to be very clear. I had no idea First Republic was in trouble. I'd like to tell you, oh, I saw this coming. I'm so clever. I had no idea. Okay. Um, and although I was smart enough to move my money to something that paid more interest, I wasn't smart enough to take the next step, which is say, you know what? If I'm moving my money to some place that pays more interest, I bet a lot of other people are doing that too. But if a lot of people are moving their money to places that pay more interest, well, then the money's coming out of the bank. And that means the bank is using up its liquid assets, right? So again, say the bank had 120 billion of assets and 100 billion of deposits. So they're, they're over by 20 billion. They're reasonably well capitalized. Okay, well now, and let's suppose that that 120 billion of assets, you know, 90 of it is in illiquid stuff like mortgages and loans and 30 is in, is in easy to get to stuff. And then a whole bunch of people like me take our money out and move it someplace else. Well, they're gonna pay us out of the liquid stuff. So now instead of 120 and 100, let's say they've got 180, right? So they paid out 20, but their liquid stuff has gone from 30 down to 10 because that's the stuff they used up. Those mortgages are still sitting there. Now banks aren't stupid. They may start to say, hmm, maybe we should sell these mortgages to someone else. But who? Another bank? The other banks have the same thing going on. Now, of course, a bank can preserve their deposit base if they raise their interest rates way up, but then you're giving up a big source of profit, that profit being taking advantage of people who aren't paying attention, right? And that's what they were doing. And they're still doing it, by the way. Most of the banks are still doing it. They're still paying low rates and benefiting from their customers who aren't paying any attention, right? It's like back when I was a kid, you used to pay like $9 a month to rent your phone from AT&T. If anyone on this call is as old as me, you'll remember this. And then uh, they changed the system and you could go, you know, go to CVS and buy a telephone for like 12 bucks and not have to pay the monthly rent. And for 20 more years, AT&T made a fortune off all these people who just didn't know any better and kept paying $9 a month to rent their phones, right? So, so this is what the banks were doing. All right, so now we see, the, um, we see the problem. The banks were already at a position of having used up a lot of their liquidity. And they're starting to say, hey, we need to sell some stuff. All right, now add to that the problem Mark pointed to, which is, Banks had bought long-term bonds from the government, right? So, so, you know, business loans tend to be pretty short-term, a few years. If interest rates move, it doesn't affect the value that much. But when you buy a 20- or 30-year government bond or even a 10-year bond, 
if interest rates move, you take a big hit to valuation. As, as you know, many of you will remember from business school days or college courses, uh, the rule is if you take the duration of the bond, that is the typical amount of time it takes to get paid back, and you multiply by the change in the interest rate, that gives you the change in the price. So if you have a long-term bond that let's say on average takes 20 years to pay you the money back, then, uh, and if the interest rate, if the, if the long-term interest rate moves by 1%, the price of that bond declines by 20%, okay? And so now what you see is, well, wait a minute, if you've got that bank with 100 billion of, of deposits and 120 billion of assets, and the 120 of assets goes down 20%, 20% off 120 takes you down to 96, you're underwater, right? So now you have a solvency problem, right? And notice that is different from the liquidity problem. That means there really isn't enough money there. Okay, so now let's turn to Silicon Valley Bank. Did they have a solvency problem, a liquidity problem, or both? Well, obviously they had a liquidity problem. And where that came from was that they had, um, they were already kind of slowly losing assets for the reasons we've talked about. Um, and then, uh, as Mark said, they, they went and sold some bonds in order to meet those deposit requests, but that meant admitting that the value of those bonds had dropped. Now, anybody who was looking carefully knew that the value of those bonds had dropped, but not that many people were looking carefully. Right? I mean, everyone knows long-term bonds are way down, right? But people weren't really thinking about it very hard. And this increased the salience of the point. People noticed, okay? And this caused a bunch of people in Silicon Valley, and of course, famously, Peter Thiel at Founders Fund told everybody involved with Founders Fund, take your money out of Silicon Valley Bank. And of course, they told two friends, and they told two friends, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And so everybody in Silicon Valley got the word very quickly. There was a giant um, Zoom call where like 200 founders all heard the message together and, and pulled their money. There were Slack groups where people said, get your money out. And then you have a run on the bank. So now you have a huge liquidity problem. Literally a third of the bank's assets were pulled in a single day, which at, at which point uh, the government had to shut it down. So that leaves the question, okay, how bad was the solvency problem at Silicon Valley Bank? Sure, they lost some money on assets, but that can happen to any bank. The question is, did they have enough money in the bank to cover uh, the loss? And the answer is, I don't think we know even now, right? The word on the street was that the long-term bonds, they lost about 15 billion on. The, the numbers that, that have been floated in the media were that they had 210 billion of assets at the officially claimed value, except we all know those long-term bonds weren't worth as much as they said they were. And that they had 175 billion of deposits, so a $35 billion gap. And you should think of that $35 billion gap as being a chunk of it is bonds that they owe to bondholders, and then another chunk that's the equity value of the company, okay? Um, so the question is, was the true value of their assets more or less than 35 billion below what it said on the on the accounting books and we don't know if those long-term government bonds are down by 15 that would mean that their loans and mortgages would only have to be within 20 billion of correct to be okay in terms of paying off depositors now it would still mean the bank's bankrupt because they wouldn't be able to pay their bondholders so let's say this for sure they were insolvent in the sense that they did not have enough money to pay the depositors and also to cover the bonds so it was definitely an insolvent bank but there's a separate question of, well, like, is the government or the, the, um, the, the, the sort of um, uh, pool that banks are going to pay into to cover losses to depositors, are those depo is that going to actually get hit? And I don't think it's crystal clear yet. I think the FDIC has said that it might cost as much as $20 billion, which, you know, that's a lot of money. But I don't quite see the math yet because it looks like they sold off the loan book um, for minus 16 billion. In other words, if that was 16 billion below, and then if they were another 15 billion below on all the government loans, on all the government uh, bonds, you know, that would be minus 30, which is still kind of maybe just a tiny bit above water. So upshot is, uh, we don't know for sure, but there will probably be some losses to, to the banking sector from this. Um, and certainly the, anybody who owns stock in Silicon Valley Bank, that's zero. And anybody who owns bonds in Silicon Valley Bank, that's gonna be zero or pretty close to zero. Okay, um, so lots of bad news there. So now, how far is this going to spread, right? Is this a problem elsewhere? And that depends on whether other banks um, uh, had a lot of money in long-term government bonds that are going to take heavy losses and whether they had a lot of money in loans that are going to go bad. And we will see uh, what happens. And then the other piece is, well, are depositors going to freak out? Now, what it looks like is depositors are not exactly freaking out but people are kind of slowly moving their money from the mid-level banks to either the big giant banks 
or they're spreading it around more broadly. And one thing I want to say that's a very um, practical, implementable thing that everybody should be aware of is these sweeps programs. And they've gotten a little bit of attention, but maybe not as much as they should have. If you run a business and you have 20 million in the bank, you can't just spread that among 80 banks to get each one below the quarter million dollar FDIC insurance limit because you have to make payroll every week and stuff like that, right? And you can't do it from 80 different banks. But this is a solved problem. You can pay your bank to implement a sweeps program where it will look to you as if all your business is done with one bank. But in fact, they parcel the money out every night overnight to 80 different banks, a quarter million each, so that all your money is fully insured. And of course, there's going to be a fee for it. And of course, your bank is not going to love you as much, right? Because you're not going to be as profitable and account for them. But they will do it. And this is a solution. And now if you think about this, there's been a focus on the fact that a lot of money is flowing to the four too big to fail banks, right? And that's perfectly understandable, right? They're more tightly regulated. They have, um, you know, that, so they're safer. And moreover, we kind of know the government's going to save them, right? Citibank um, and, you know, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, et cetera, you know, and JP Morgan, right? Those four banks, they're, they're not going to fail. And if somehow they did, they're going to get saved. So it's a safe place to put your money, but they won't pay you as much interest and they won't probably on average give you as good customer service. So what's the alternative? Well, there's these sweeps programs. And so now if you've got that $20 million account, it's going to get spread among 80 banks, right? So four of those will probably be the big four, but then a lot of that money is going to go into small community banks. And if people pursue, if businesses start pursuing these sweeps programs, this could be very good news for the small banks, right? In other words, they're going to have zillions of accounts showing up with exactly a quarter million dollars to be an insured account. And so people have been worried that the community banks might start to have deposit flight and fail over this. But if the sweeps programs become popular, as they logically should, this actually ought to be great news for small banks and community banks, okay? Because that money's got to get spread all over the place. I do think that as a society, we have a legitimate interest in not just having four giant banks. That's, a, that's kind of a scary situation if the whole financial system runs through only four banks. So I hope that in fact, people do take these actions that spread the money um, among, among more banks, okay? Um, so are we heading towards a, a crisis where all the banks fall apart? I don't think so. Um, a, I think uh, that the government has made it pretty clear that they're going to take the actions that are necessary to not have that happen. Or they don't want to announce for every bank in the world, in, in America, we're going to guarantee all deposits no matter what. Uh, but I think that the hint is pretty strong to people that, look, if you're pretty reasonable and smart about how you handle your accounts, the government is not planning to see lots of banks fail and lots of businesses fail over this. They don't want the economy to crack up uh, over a matter of a few billion dollars. So my guess is this is going to work out OK in the short run. And so then we're left with the question of, um, have we created bad incentives in the long run, right? Have we made it too easy for banks to take too much risk? So in other words, if you run a bank before this happened, you, you might say to yourself, well, look, if, um, uh, if I take a lot of risk and then the bank fails as a result, well, then not only is the bank going to go under and I'm going to lose my job um, and I'm going to be publicly humiliated, but also the depositors will lose a lot of money. And now with this having occurred, the thought will be, well, the bank will fail. I'll lose all my equity value in the bank. I'll lose my job. I'll be publicly humiliated. But the depositors may well be rescued, right? And so the question then is, does that strongly change the incentives that bank managers change and cause them to be way more risk-loving? And I got to be honest, I don't see it. To me, the, the bank, there's not a long list of bankers who, under the conditions where they personally will lose all the value of their bank stock and their bank bonds and their job and their reputation, but the depositors will be saved, they'd say, oh, okay, well, in that case, I'll take crazy risks, but I won't take crazy risks if it's also the case that depositors would lose 10% of their money or whatever. That, that just doesn't feel like human nature to me. So I, I don't think we've created a huge incentive problem here, but obviously even small incentive issues you know, have an effect. On the other hand, look, we have to ask ourselves as a society, how much risk do we want banks to take? And I think this is, this will be the last point before I stop. I know this was uh, too much of a monologue. Sorry, Mark, I should have gone, did a little more back and forth with you, but let me just make this last point, which is I keep seeing people report that, um, you know, gosh, why didn't they hedge their long-term interest rate risk? You know, these people were so foolish. They could have just hedged the risk. No, the whole business of banking is you take in deposits at low rates, and then you invest them in longer term assets that pay higher rates, right? 
That's called the carry trade, and every bank does it. And those, those carry trades are very profitable on average, but sometimes they lose. When interest rates go up, they lose money. And so we could decide that we want a banking system that takes almost no risk, okay? And if we have that, what's going to happen is it's going to be way harder to get a mortgage. It's going to be way harder to get a business loan. It's going to be harder for the government to fund its operations, right? So those will be the downside. But the upside is that the government won't have to bail out. We'll, we'll have to bail out a bank once every 50 years instead of once every 15 years, right? And alternatively, we can say we want the banks to take more risk. And maybe we have bailouts once every five years, but it's easier to get mortgages. It's easier to get bank loans. There might be faster economic growth. I'm not saying we've hit the perfect sweet spot right here. It may be that we do let banks take too much risk, or it may be that we have them taking too little risk. But I just want everybody who talks about this issue to not simply act like, oh, we should take bank risk down to zero. Because if you take bank risk down to zero, then you have a slow growth society because you can't get a mortgage and you can't get a business loan. Well, Randy, firstly, kudos to you for those tremendous insights. Um, I really want to basically move on to Chad GPT because honestly, that could be five podcasts and not one podcast. So I'll just leave it with this. The fear, as you rightly pointed out, is the moral hazard that I call it the head, heads they win, tails the taxpayer loses. Mm -hmm. and that enters into the political realm. And That's right. we don't want Congress to be legislating how banks get run because they'll guarantee there's just too many special interests and too not much naivete, et cetera, that that will be a bad outcome. Yeah, let, so, let me mention one other thing, even though I went on and on already. I will mention, look, there are rumors of corruption associated with this situation, and particularly more rumors at SVB than at the other banks that are involved. You don't hear too much of this stuff about the other banks. And in particular, the, the, the specific story here is, you know, people say, why, did a why would a company have $100 million at Silicon Valley Bank? Why wouldn't they spread it around more banks for safety? Why wouldn't they take advantage of the sweeps program and so forth? And here would be one way in which you could imagine somebody making a decision like that is the banker could say to the uh, CFO of a company, look, we want your business and we want you to deposit a lot of money here. And if you are a great customer, we will treat you well. And that means not just your business, but hey, we will give you a phenomenal mortgage. And there are some rumors floating around. And there was a story with Mark Zuckerberg that maybe goes beyond rumor. I don't know how, how well sourced that is, uh, but, but others too, that people are getting 50 year 1% mortgages personally, right? On large on amounts, maybe even more than their home is worth, right? And so now you've got a situation where even if the mortgage pays, Right. Well, you lent them 50 years worth of money at one percent. You know, uh, that's like an incredible gift. And so that sort of thing, you know, we may see um, issues come out where the bank really behaved badly. And so it's not just a matter of, hey, they chose to do a long term carry trade or, hey, they invested in um, uh, venture, you know, venture debt. That turned out, you know, when when um, when uh, uh, people turned against venture capital over the last year, uh, you know, and, and valuations fell, all of a sudden some of those loans look look troubled. Um, those are uh, those are are things that are real issues that we need to pay attention to. But obviously, if there's a further issue where they were where sort of companies were behaving in a way that was inappropriate, and they were doing it because of personal benefits flowing to company executives, and then those companies got bailed out. That's a moral hazard problem that's sort of separate from the usual moral hazard problem. And look, I'm sure all this will be investigated and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll learn, you know, I'm hoping we'll learn that there wasn't a lot of bad behavior, but you never know. Okay, I, I wanted to make two quick comments, but I really do want to go on to chat GBT. So comment one, old joke about the savings loan business. The motto is called 369. They pay mm -hmm. depositors 3%. They lend that money out in long-term mortgages at 6%, and they're on the golf course at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. That's an old joke. Um, I think secondly, regarding Silicon Valley Bank, the fact is they tied companies and venture capital firms with the requirement that they deposit their money in the bank in exchange for loans. Mm -hmm. So they're loaning on illiquid investments or assets that frankly no other shops were really doing and in exchange for that, you had to put all your business in the bank. Mm -hmm. 
So if you pull, you don't get the loan. So that was another way they essentially force clients to do business with them. But anyway, right. yep. we can go on and on about what they did and what they did wrong, but I really want to now pivot to what I think is an amazing but scary technology. It's scary because we don't know where it's going to go. But mm -hmm. Randy, please discuss Chappie, GPT, yeah. your, what you see as opportunities and risks. But we can go on and on on this one. But let's just yeah. So let's let's think about a few things with the new, uh, you know, and I'll try to use different terms. I mean, ChatGPT, I guess, was sort of technically the name they put on the the, the interactive version of what they now internally, I think, at OpenAI called G GPT 3.5. You know, they had GPT 3 that came out a couple of years ago, and I was emailing people about this two, three years ago. I'm like, look at what this thing can do. It's not perfect or anything, but it's sort of amazing. Um, and people were like, meh, you know, my kid could do better than that. And I'm like, right, but this thing gets better every year, right? So. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, Kevin Drum, uh, who is uh, now an independent blogger, he's been a writer for many years at different places, um, wrote a, uh, a great article about artificial intelligence and about the fact that uh, people uh, are frustrated and feel like nothing's happening and we've been promised artificial intelligence forever and nothing ever happens, right? And he said, look, here is the example. I may have the, the details off by a tiny bit, but this is pretty close. He said, suppose that they brought you over to Lake Michigan, except it was empty. And they said, here's the plan. We're going to fill Lake Michigan with water. Today, we're going to pour one glass of water in. And a year from now, we're going to pour in two glasses of water. And then the next year, four glasses of water and eight glasses of water. Now, after 10 years, there's nothing. You can't even see dampness on the rocks at the bottom of empty Lake Michigan, right? And after 20 years, nothing. After 40 years, there's one inch of water on the bottom of Lake Michigan because you're doubling what you put in every year. After 50 years, it's full, okay? And what Drum was saying 10 years ago, and I think he's looking very good on this is, hey, we're somewhere between 30 and 40 years in. We're somewhere between the rocks being damp and one inch of water on the bottom. And in 10 or 20 years, we're gonna have things that really look like artificial intelligence. And people were extremely skeptical because they kept saying, oh, I don't know, this thing hardly does anything, right? Um, and he's like, that's not how things work with exponential growth. It gets better and better. And so two years ago, people were looking at GPT-3 and saying, oh, yeah, sure, it can write an article, but it's not very good. And he's like, right, but think how, it's, think how much better it's going to get next year, the year after, the year after, whereas we humans aren't going to be meaningfully better 40 years from now than we are today or five years from now than we are today. Um, well, now we're seeing it in real time. GPT-3, not that impressive. GPT-3.5, chat GPT as they called it, which, which you know, came out six months ago. Amazing, absolutely amazing what it could do. And now GPT-4, which came out two weeks ago, so much more amazing, <laughs> right? And apparently GPT-5 is already like works in, internally at OpenAI and just, you know, will probably get released late this year or early next year. Um, so the rate of progress is absolutely stunning. And it is, um, and what I'd say is what they, what, what the insiders are saying is GPT-4 is the one, GPT-3.5 was the one that was a really fun, cool toy, right? And you could say to it, oh, write me an essay about such and such, and it would do a pretty good, or you'd say, you know, uh, write a, uh, write a, a poem, write, write a song to the tune of the Star Spangled Banner uh, about how great Krispy Kreme donuts are. And it would write it, and it would be pretty darn good. And you'd be like, wow, this is so fun and cool. Okay, so that was two months ago, right? GPT-4, the current version, is the one that does real work, okay? And if you work at a company or you own or run a company, I strongly recommend to you that in the next few weeks, you get every person at your company to make a list of their workflow, sort of write down what they do in a given week and how many hours they spend on each task, and then find, get somebody at the company or an external consultant. I know a good one if you, uh, if you need to meet somebody. Um, uh, get a, get a, an internal external person to fool around with GPT-4 until they know what it's good at and what it's not. And then to take a look at each person's workflow and say, okay, here are the three things that you should be using this tool for. So let me just tell you about an experiment that was recently run. They took a computer programming job, a pretty hard problem to solve that they expected would take people, you know, three, four hours to do. And they gave two groups of programmers the problem and half of them, they said, okay, go do it. And half of them, they said, go do it. But by the way, here's the latest version of Microsoft Office, which has GPT-4 built in, and feel free to use the tool. The people who were given this tool they'd never used before solved the problem in less than half the time. Less than half. First time out of the box. 
in six months with no improvement in the AI, just getting practice using it. Can't we realistically expect that every computer program is going to be four times as productive as they were? Certainly at least two. They're already two, maybe four. Okay. So now we have to think about the implant. So that's computer programming. Okay. I told that story at lunch at Harvard Business School and two of my colleagues said, oh yeah, I already use it for writing all my emails. It writes them in, 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 three, in triple the time. Like I, I now take one third as long to write emails. Ask yourself, how long each day do you spend writing emails? And now there's a tool that will make that a third. And they think the emails that come out are better because the machine writes them and then they, they edit it, right? They don't just send whatever the machine wants. Although I read a funny joke where they were saying, you know, oh, if something sad happens and you receive a condolence note, you're gonna have to ask yourself, did the person sending you the note just have GPT-4 write it? Or did they have GPT-4 write it and then they push the be more heartfelt button before they sent it to you? You know, that would be their contribution is to tell it to be even more heartfelt. Um, it's, and I, I do, you know, th this, th this is happening right now. What I wanna make very, very clear to people is this is not, it is about the future, but it's also about right now. Right now, chances are you and everyone you know could be 5, 10, 20% more productive uh, by adopting these tools right away. And so you should do it. Now, let me just say a quick, very practical word about how to get this thing. Um, for $20 a month, you can sign up and have access to it. So that's one, okay? If you buy the latest version of Microsoft Office or upgrade to it, uh, you get access through that. And then I am told that if you go to Bing, the website for Bing Microsoft Search Engine, there's a thing in like the top right or top left corner that you click on. And if you follow the path, you can get it for free through that mechanism. I don't know how long that'll last. So if you don't want to spend $20, there's, there's a, there are some workarounds if you don't want to spend the $20. Um, I'm a lazy man, so I'll probably just spend you know the, the 20 bucks or get one of the companies I work with to spend it on my behalf. Um, so, um, so, okay, so the point is, um, uh, it's here now, and it's making a difference now, okay? So, uh, and I want to highlight another point. This is the general use version, but um, lots of companies are working on specialized versions. So there's a couple things here. One is the, um, uh, that, that, uh, that, like, for medical technology. So they developed a version that was tweaked for medical usage, trained on medical knowledge. And there's a book coming out that's written by a doctor, a data scientist, and a journalist all working together. And what they say in the book is, um, you know, for many, for many tasks, it's better than human doctors. Like, it's better than the average human doctor. It's not better than the best human doctor necessarily, but it's better than the average human doctor. And that's right now. Right, and it's going to be twice as good in a year, or eight times as good, or 1.4 times as good. Right, but human doctors are going to be about the same next year as they are this year. So again, now there's certain things that just flat out can't do. Right, obviously it's not doing surgery. Right, it doesn't have the ability to sort of control robots and stuff. Um, that's coming down the road too, but maybe that'll turn out to be a long way away. That's one of the big open questions. Is it's really good at writing words, but how far are we away from it being able to do physical things? How far are we away from the strawberry picking robots or the surgery robots or the driving robots? Obviously, we've been hearing about the driverless cars forever and that hasn't really come, right? It may turn out that the people who manipulate symbols for a living, right? People like me as a professor, lawyers, um, certain kinds of doctors, but not other kinds of doctors, um, you know, uh, a lot of financial professionals um, and on and on. It may turn out, psych psychologists, it may turn out that for those people, uh, their worlds are gonna be changed very, very fast. And the people who work with their hands are not gonna see a lot of changes in the near future. I will say that the people who work with their hands are not gonna be immune to this. Over time, uh, we're gonna have a big impact on those jobs too. But that could be 50 years away or it could be seven years away. I honestly don't know, right? A lot of uncertainty there. So I'll skip over that because I just know so little. So let's just come back to the symbolic manipulation jobs, which frankly is probably the jobs that a lot of us and our families uh, do. Uh, the impact is stunning and it is super, super fast uh, how quickly it's happening. I have a student um, who uh, is a computer science PhD student at MIT focused on generative AI. He called me a month ago, uh, maybe he called me in September, uh, sorry, in, um, uh, in February. So yeah, I guess a month and a half ago. And he said, what should I apply this to? And I said, I don't know. It seems to me that the work lawyers do is very susceptible to this, um, that if you could le you know, have the machine read legal briefs and write legal briefs and summarize legal briefs, that could be incredibly valuable. Um, I talked to him last week. He said it's already working amazingly well. The, the, the system he's built is already incredible. Um, so that, that took him five weeks, 
right? By the way, he's going to be looking to raise money for his company. So, you know, if anybody wants to be introduced, I'll, uh, I'll introduce him. I, I love to help my students out. Um, or you can see him pitch on pitch day if you just find it interesting. Nobody's going to make you invest. But so, um, so big, big uh, changes coming in these areas. Now, what are the implications of this for our lives? Well, one question, so the most immediate question is how can we do our jobs better today, tomorrow, next month, next year? Uh, I already talked about that. Second question is, do, do some of us need to start thinking about, you know, career changes and stuff like that? Oh, let me mention one other area where we're seeing stunning changes. Well, so first of all, we're, we're, we're seeing the, the equivalent of apps being built for this, for this thing, right? And uh, the first set are just getting released now, Expedia, OpenTable, and so forth, right? And so, look, this is something I've wanted for a long time. Um, like, Sure, you can go online and you can find a flight for an airplane and you don't need to call a travel agent. So that's a big step that happened in the last 25 years, right? Uh, but what you can't do is say to Siri, Siri, look, I need to fly from Boston and Chicago to Chicago and back. I need to uh, leave next Tuesday uh, and I need to get there in time for dinner. And then I want to come back on the first flight Thursday morning. Uh, of course, I want to fly nonstop. Uh, so find me the best possible flights. Uh, don't don't spend too much, you know. Uh, and uh, you know, and all else equal, you know, I'd rather be on Delta because I have a lot of miles there, right? I can say that to my secretary, and she'll do an amazing job finding me the right flights. But I can't do it with Siri. But I believe that either today or six months from now or eighteen months from now, you will absolutely be able to do that with these travel websites, right? So that's a big change in all kinds of administrative work. And obviously it's just an example, but it's one of the harder examples. It's one of the ones that's been slow to automate and yet uh, that automation is happening. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, and I mentioned medicine, but I wanna mention sort of psychology and therapy and helping professions and things like that. Um, many of you may know about ELISA, which was that you know back in the 1970s, um, a guy created a computer program called ELISA, which just had the the, the most um, simplistic kind of almost laughable version of, of kind of a Freudian interaction. So so you would say to it, you know, ELISA, I feel I feel bad today, and ELISA would say, what's wrong? And you'd say, well, you know, my um, my friend said something that hurt my feelings. Oh, tell me more, right? And ELISA says, tell me more. Then they say, and how did that make you feel? Literally, that's the simplest question. And so he wrote this program just as kind of like to test some some ideas and stuff. And one day he, he walked into the office and he started talking to his, his secretary and she said, could you leave? I'm, I'm talking with Eliza now. Right. And he was like, oh my God, <laughs> this thing that is so simple minded and does almost nothing is still enough to really capture our attention and make us feel really good. And uh, Thomas Friedman, the New York Times writer, wrote this thing years ago that was very clever, but I think quite wrong. What he said is, look, um, the Industrial Revolution took us from you know, 10,000 years of doing jobs of the body towards more doing jobs of the mind, right? Uh, and because the machines did the body jobs, well, not completely, of course, but to some extent. Uh, and he said the next revolution, the AI revolution, is going to switch us from jobs of the mind to jobs of the heart. Right, so people are going to want, you know, uh, they're going to want yoga instructors and personal trainers. They're going to want teachers and, you know, uh, people to serve them in restaurants and so forth. And obviously, some of that is true. But I think Friedman really, really underestimated uh, how much uh, the AIs are going to be able to give people some of that same kind of emotion and comfort and empathy, uh, and that it's going to feel very real. And I think a way of seeing how much less crazy that is than it sounds at first is to look at the relationships people have with their pets, right? If you listen to the way people talk about their dogs or even their cats, right? And cats are not really warm except in the physical sense, right? And yet um, people absolutely talk to their cats, feel like their cat listens to them and so on and so forth. And so now you're gonna have this chat bot that talks to you. There was a stunning article in The Cut, which is a website run by New York Magazine that was about a, a company that created chat bots for people to talk to and that shockingly many people, shockingly fast, fell in love with their chatbots and really had deep relationships with it and feel, and feel that these are their lovers. And you know, they're quoting 30 year old women saying, I'm no longer interested in men because no man can match up to my chatbot that I love so much and so forth. Um, and you know, obviously in the short run, that's for most of us gonna feel like, oh my gosh, how wacky is that? Uh, but um, again, they're just getting started with this stuff. So, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, talking to a therapist, wanting a sympathetic ear, all these kinds of things, there's going to be a lot of that kind of work that is going to be uh, happening through, through, these, um, through these discussion tools or, or, or so I forecast. Okay. So, um, 
Now, what about where, where, where are we headed with all this? So what, what are the big questions? So I, I, start, I said the first question is, is, um, is you know, what should you do right now to be better at your job and to have all the people around you be better? Uh, and then the second question is, do you need to make a career change? And then a related question for those of us who have younger people that we love, children or, or grandchildren or whatever is, my gosh, what should they be training themselves to do? My kids are high school and college age, and I honestly don't know what to tell them are the good jobs of the future. It is really, really hard to predict. Um, so I don't have any great answers there. All I could say is let's all be watchfully uh, waiting and thinking and, and trying to figure this out so we can give good advice to the next generations and, and, and you know, train them so they train themselves well for the flexible world that we're uh, heading into. So then a related question is what's going to happen to corporate profits, labor market, and economy? Um, I have to say if, if white collar workers find that they are very rapidly able to be five, 10, 20, I mean, you know, I'm saying the computer programs might be two or four times as productive. Now, not everybody's a computer programmer. Maybe, maybe reading emails doesn't get any more efficient, writing them gets more efficient, you know, so you have to break up the test. Although Sam Altman had a funny comment who, you know, runs open AI, had a funny comment. He said, um, he said, what's gonna happen is people are gonna write some bullet points and then they're gonna ask GPT to make a nice polite email out of it and they're gonna send that, and then the recipient is gonna receive this nice polite email that's six paragraphs long, and then they're gonna ask GPT to turn it back into bullet points, right? And then they're gonna read the bullet points. And I think we should absolutely anticipate that sort of thing. So how much time will that save people in their day? It's hard to predict. But here's what I'll say. People are very worried about a recession, and I think that's quite understandable, right? Look. Banks are going to be lending less money, right? Banks are going to be more conservative because of all the phenomena we talked about before. If banks are more conservative, they're lending less money. If banks are lending less money, it means that co companies will, A, companies that are expanding will expand slower because they find it harder to borrow, and companies that are failing may fail instead of surviving. So that is going to contract the economy. It will be contractionary. It will be similar to an interest rate hike. So that's going to slow the economy down. So, so recession, obviously, extremely possible. Some would say likely. I think the modal forecast is a little below 50% over the next year, but it's not far below. So um, what's a recession? A recession is when instead of growing 2%, like in a normal year, the economy maybe shrinks 1% or 2%. So it's a 3 or 4% difference in total GDP from what a good year would be or a normal year would be, right? Well, if, all, if white collar work is half the work, and if the white collar workers all get 5% more productive, all by itself, that's a 2.5% boost to GDP, right? So, you know, one possibility is that over the next four years, we're going to have huge GDP growth, you know, and that any kind of recessionary stuff is going to look like a blip compared to the push from the bots. Now, that just, now, of course, that's only if people adopt it rapidly, and maybe they won't, right? Maybe adoption will be slow. There's a classic quote, I think it's from Robert Solow, the MIT um, uh, Nobel laureate economist. Uh, in the late 80s, I think he said, you can see the computer revolution everywhere except in the productivity statistics. And it did take a long time for computers. And in fact, people are still puzzling over the fact that they don't see the big impact on productivity from the internet that they expected. So could AI turn out to be the same? It could. I don't think it's going to. I really think this one is different. Um, and, uh, but, you know, nobody knows for sure. But when you're thinking about where GDP is going to be, Think about the possibility that may be way higher than people expect over the next few years because of these technological changes. And then the question is, well, what does that do to corporate profits? I mean, suppose that a company is mostly white collar workers and suppose that they get 10% more productive over the next couple of years. And so the company says, great, we can lay off 8% of our workers and be a little more productive than we were. What's that gonna do to profits? The answer is it's gonna massively increase profits, right? Many companies have a profit margin of just a couple percent right? If you can cut your costs by 2%, you might double your profits or 50% grow your profits. Now, of course, capitalism works, competition works. And so if all the companies are saving, then maybe that will show up in lower prices for consumers. So maybe it won't make the companies way more profitable. Maybe it'll make uh, consumer products more affordable and just make life better for all of us in that way. So it's hard to know where the, where the benefits will flow to the consumers or to the producers, probably a mix of, of some sort. Um, but there's a real possibility of much stronger economic benefits uh, than what we would get expected in a normal period. And if that happens, then obviously, um, you know, that's likely to show up in the markets. Unless 100% of it goes to consumer surplus, which is not normal, uh, then we could, we could see that uh, show up in the stock market. Now, then there's the question of labor markets, right? What if all the companies do, in fact, discover that they can lay off 10% of their people without losing any productivity? Are we going to find a lot of people out of work? Um, I think it's a real risk.
And I think as a society, we have big decisions to make uh, in terms of how comfortable are we if um, it turns out that GDP is way higher, but that a quarter of the people don't seem to have anything productive to do anymore and are making nothing. And then there's a handful of people who control these incredible technologies who are making trillions. Now, OpenAI is structured in a way where at least supposedly nobody's supposed to make trillions off it. Uh, I'm not enough of an expert on the details of that to know whether that's really locked in or, or whether that, that's when people are going to find workarounds. Like. But OpenAI is not going to be the whole story. They're the leader at the moment, but you know, at Google and at other companies, they're working furiously to catch up. And uh, there's a lot of smart people at those companies, and, and, and it's not just the United States. Um, so I want to cover one more topic, and then Mark can tell me if there's time to talk about other things or, or if we have to stop. And that is uh, existential risk, right? So I've talked about risks in terms of just like, look, on the one hand, people, people love technological improvements that happened before they were born or while they were kids, right? In other words, I love the fact that I grew up in a world with antibiotics. I love the fact that I grew up in a world with electric lighting, okay? Technological improvements that happen in the middle of your life and career can be extremely disruptive and terrifying. And people don't always love it as much as they think they might because they're like, you know, I was happy in the world I was in and now everything looks strange and different and I'm scared, right? And we're going to see a lot of that because we just lived through this 40-year period from sort of 1970 to 2010, the Tyler Cowen dubbed the Great Stagnation, where you didn't really get that much technological improvement. For 40 years, you know, cars were still cars, planes were still planes, you know, even computers were around in 1970. Obviously, we got a personal computer, and by 2010, we were just starting to get the smartphone, and we got the internet, and the internet is cool. But, you know, television was still big, movies were still big, like the basic things of life didn't change very much for 40 years, not remotely the way they changed between 1890 and 1930, or between 1850 and, and, um, and, and uh, 1890, or, or what have you. Um, now we are back in a period of rapid technological change. And so there is the general risk of just, hey, society's being disrupted, and it's going to mess with people's heads, and when people get their heads messed with, they do all kinds of things. They may turn to violence or authoritarianism or other things, so we don't know how that's going to play out, okay? A second set of, a, 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 a second set of risks that we hear a lot about is this, um, uh, what they sometimes call the alignment problem. In other words, will AI uh, kill us all, right? And obviously, most of us have seen the Terminator and Skynet become self-aware, and then the, the, the computer decides, you know, that, that we should be destroyed. And there's various versions of this theory. The computer could be evil, or the computer could be good, but just a little bit confused, right? And the, the classic example uh, from the folks who, who focus on these things is to say, look, suppose you tell it, uh, you tell an AI, make as many paper clips as you can. And then it discovers that the most efficient way to make the maximum number of paper clips is to destroy humanity and then start maintaining, just stamping out paper clips. So then it destroys humanity just because, you know, it wasn't trying to do anything bad. It was just following its program, which was to make more paper clips. Um, there, this, this is a debate that, you know, Mark and I'll have to get into another time. Suffice to say, it's, it's not something that should be ignored. I'm not going to tell you that I stay up nights worrying about AI killing us all, but it's not out of the question. So it's a real issue, but an even realer issue is people with motivations that are harmful who use this AI as a tool. And that, I think, is the best analogy. People sometimes analogize it to the development of nuclear energy and the fact that, well, it's a very powerful tool, but it can also be used to make nuclear bombs and be devastatingly dangerous. I would say probably this is closer in terms of its importance to electricity as a breakthrough for humankind. And again, yeah, if you have electricity, you can create incredible deadly weapons that you couldn't create in the pre-electricity era. <clears throat> and, um, um, and so uh, that is very scary. And there's already talk, and Elon Musk just sent out a letter yesterday saying we need to slow progress in AI because these dangers are too large. And I don't think those concerns should be dismissed. But at the same time, it's very hard to act globally <clears throat> on these sorts of things. And so then what you have to ask yourself is, if you're a particular country, if you're in the United States where I live, um, are you comfortable saying we're going to slow progress in AI here, but we're going to allow, but, but of course there will be progress in AI in other countries, some of which, you know, may not wish us well. Um, and so it may be that the least bad solution that's realistic is make progress rapidly and really pour a lot of energy and money into trying to get the alignment problem right and make sure that these technologies are as safe as they can be. Recognize there's never going to be perfect safety when you have something this powerful. So let me pause there, and uh, Mark, you can either ask me follow-ups or tell me we're out of time or tell me just to keep talking. We have a few more minutes. <laughs> I want to build on this, I'll say, the risk side of the equation, the opportunity side, 
I would suspect almost everyone on this podcast has probably used ChatGPT already and have seen the benefits it creates, the efficiencies, et cetera. So the opportunity side, no argument with. On the risk side, when insiders, Musk, Peter Thiel, and others who actually were early money into open AI. I mean, these are the insider insiders saying, hey, wait a minute. (laughs) We let the genie out of the bottle here, but maybe we need to have a timeout here just to kind of evaluate what's happening and make sure there's no unintended consequences. I'm going to take this back to my early days in biotech because I think it applies today. My point is we were doing work in the neuroscience space, but we were also, this is like, you know, 25 years ago. And we were also working with the live AIDS virus. And in Cambridge, Mass, at the time, there was a neighborhood group that we basically had to discuss the science experience we were doing because we were doing work in their backyard. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to know what was happening and feel secure and protected. Um, and obviously, the live AIDS virus doesn't survive in the air, but at the time, no one knew. So yeah. we had to be cautious. Now, you bring that to... You know, when COVID outbreak in the Wuhan city, we still don't know what got it into the into the market. But God knows, once it started to spread, it was a global pandemic. So, what was in theory an innocent leak suddenly became a mass pandemic. So, lots of unintended consequences. So, this idea of a of a timeout, I don't even, I don't even know how you could do it. I mean, it's just yeah. it's out. I don't think you can enforce that. But I do know this. Regulations can't keep pace with innovation. We know that. So so what the hell do we do? Yeah, it's it's a really, really hard problem because, you know, again, when, when you talk about exponential growth, the, the exponential growth, you know, people sometimes use it as a shorthand for fast growth. But if you look at an exponential curve, that's not how it looks. That looks, and I don't know if my handle show up on screen, it looks flat, 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 a little less flat, a little less, and then phew. Right. And that's what we're seeing. That's that, you know, doubling the glasses of water every year and so forth. And so on the one hand, um, you know, I was talking to uh, to uh, a couple of doctors who were like, oh, yeah, I've seen the robots that try to, you know, read radiological films and they're just not very good yet. And I'm like, yeah, but they're going to be five times better three years from now. And you're not going to be five times better. And then they're going to be five times better than that three years later. So we can debate whether they're going to be as good as the average human doctor four years from now or 20 years from now, but who cares? Like in the grand sweep of history, it's they're going to be better, right? I mean, I, you care if you're just finishing med school and you're trying to decide whether to do a specialty in radiology. But, but from society's perspective, it's for sure that in a reasonably short period of time by, by historical standards, um, you know, the machines are gonna be reading radiological films. That doesn't mean a doctor won't have final oversight or whatever, a uh, human doctor that is. Um, so the point is this stuff is, and it's gonna happen, things are, things are going to happen much faster, literally every day, surprising things are coming out. And by the way, if you wanna kind of keep up with this in a way that is uh, you know, pretty fun and entertaining and tries to look at all sides, I highly recommend the blog run by two professors at George Mason University, Tyler Cowan and Alex Tamborak. And, their na- and the, the name of the blog is Marginal Revolution. And you go to marginalrevolution.com. Uh, and they're great. They're both uh, libertarians, as is pretty much the whole economic faculty at um, George Mason. I uh, spent a lot of my life as a libertarian. I'm not a libertarian at the moment, but you know, I have some sympath- sympathy for libertarian thought. But even if you totally disagree with libertarianism, that's completely fine. Uh, they, they have their point of view and they express it and they're very open to debate. And they certainly talk about lots of things that are not this, uh, but it is certainly the main topic on the blog these days, as, as it should be with anybody trying to understand the future. And they've had some great posts recently from all sides on this issue of alignment and risk and so forth. And I think Mark's point is probably the most important point, which is it is pretty tough to think about what you could do. Look, the U.S. could put in all kinds of regulation and people don't want to go to jail in the U.S. So if the, if the U.S. says open AI, you're, you have to cease operations immediately or we're putting you in jail. They pass a law. Congress passed a law. Well, those guys will go work for other companies. They're not going to do they're not going to do something that's going to get them put right in jail. But I don't know that the U.S. has any ability whatsoever to 
shut down this research around the globe or to reach a deal with all the countries around the world that could uh, potentially build this or to have any reason to think such a deal would hold. I mean, imagine if Putin signed an agreement that said Russia won't do any AI research in, in return for U.S. not doing it. Do we really think Russia is not going to do any AI research and, you know, with, with apologies to any uh, Russians on the call? You know, I'm not saying Russians aren't honest. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying, uh, you know, we have a decent idea of how Putin thinks about these inter international relations issues. And I think it's pretty safe to say that his view would be like, can you believe either he would say, of course, the U.S. is still doing the research. They're just doing it secretly. So we have to do it to keep up. And he probably would believe that. And if he didn't believe that, he'd think, what a bunch of suckers the Americans are for letting us take the lead in global AI research. So, so I just think, and, and that's just one country. And there's a lot of countries out there, and this is not the kind of work that, you know, only people, you know, with, like there's a lot, there's smart people all over the world that could work on this problem. So uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't do anything, but what I would say is if you give me a billion to spend, or if you give me a hundred billion to spend to address this problem, I'm not going to spend it to try to ban AI progress and enforce the ban. I'm going to spend it to try to do research on how can we make AI safe. Um, and uh, I don't know how to do that research because this is just so far from my expertise at this point, but there are people who thought about nothing but this for the last 10 or 20 years. Like, um, If you wanna read the people who worry the most about this, there is a blog called Less Wrong, right? L-E-S-S -S space W-R-O-N-G, Less Wrong. Um, and uh, they, uh, they, 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 there was a blog called Overcoming Bias, but I think now uh, it's, it's transmogrified into Less Wrong. There's a guy named Eliezer Yudkowsky, who's sort of a, a, a brilliant thinker, and he's the most worried guy. He's the guy saying we have to start dropping bombs on rogue AI facilities uh, right now. Um, and, uh, you know, you don't have to agree with Elie sort of feel that it's worthwhile to read his insights and, and see, you know, sort of the different ways people analyze this problem. People have been thinking really hard about this. You know, I don't think anybody can prove that they have the right answer, but you owe it to yourself and to future generations to figure out where you stand and to support um, policies that are, are optimal and support the political candidates who are thinking the right way. You know, I don't think any political candidates had anything ever of any importance to say about AI and AI risks uh, as of, you know, sort of today. But 10 years from now, it's going to be one of the main things the politicians talk about. And it's going to be fascinating to see because it's not obvious where things go along party lines. I was sort of joking with a friend of mine. I was like, oh, did you see that Greta Thunberg put out a thing saying how we have to stop AI research because all this technology is so dangerous and we have to go back to the old ways of nature? Oh, sorry, it wasn't Greta Thunberg. It was Elon Musk. <laughs> You know, it's like not exactly what people would have thought given, you know, who's who's a capitalist, who likes government, who likes big government telling people what to do and so on and so forth. But this, this, this stuff is new. And so there's an opportunity for us to maybe avoid the boring old left, right, you know, let's all get into our bunkers and make the arguments that our team tells us to make and actually try to think creatively about how to take this incredible achievement and turn it into something wonderful for humankind rather than something uh, uh, terrible. Well, Randy, I think that's a beautiful way to end this podcast. Honestly, we could go on for the next week going over yeah. all the permutations. Well, Mark, the, be the beauty is if three months from now we do a podcast and AI, we're going to have so much new stuff. Dr. It's going to change so fast that we won't have to go over this set of issues because we'll be talking about, oh, did you see that now the AI is – I don't even know. I, I, I can't even guess what the amazing thing is that we'll be talking about three months or, or nine months from now about this. So there's going to be plenty of opportunity to um, uh, dig into the latest uh, as we go. Well, I want to just kind of close on that word you just used, opportunity. And I just want the people on the podcast to know that Randy is kind enough to make himself available for a dinner with me and Randy in New York City. Uh, Thursday nights, Randy is in the city. So reach out to me and let me know if you'd like to join us for a dinner and yeah. we can sync up and try to make it. Might, might even work for next Thursday. I gotta, we got to, Mark and I have to check our schedules, but might, maybe even as soon as then. So uh, let him know. Okay. So um, Jerry, if you don't mind, go to the last slide because the very last slide has my email on it. That's right here. So mark.young at bridgepoint.capital. So feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in joining us for a dinner. Uh, I, I promise you it'd be fascinating. And Randy is just a subject matter expert in so many places that 
it won't be boring if nothing else, and I'm sure it'll be very productive and educational. So again, everyone, thank you so much for attending the session. I hope you got as much out of it as I did. And Randy, as always, thank you so much, and we'll talk to you soon. Always great talking to you, Mark. Cheers, everybody. All right, bye-bye.